So next panel, um, Rosario, uh, where are you? Um, we've, please come up and introduce um, your colleagues. We've brought more food to feed everyone um, before you all go to the strike later on. Uh, so thank you, Rosario, for being here. Thank you. Yes. Thank you to the people that is in the room, and thank you for joining us on the session. Actually, today, I mean, during the last panel, as you have been talking about climate change, we have been talking about action tracking information data. But something that is important to consider whenever we are in a context where the house is burning, where is the money? Where, are, where is this capital? Where is this financing? Where are the resources? Where are they being allocated? So for me, as an Obama scholar, actually I had the honor to join this amazing network as, an, as, an, as a scholar at the University of Chicago. And it's amazing to be in Columbia University, one of the best universities in the world, um, and introduce amazing leaders that are actually talking about where the money is going and how we can track it and how we can bring it to the climate action, how we can use it. So first, I want to, I mean, and they are not related. We have Juan, <laughs> Juan Guzman, he's from Colombia, and he is the co-founder of Pacto por el Clima, um, but he's also part of the community of the Columbia University, which is amazing. And then we have Sandra Guzman, that is actually joining us remotely from Mexico. She is she's an amazing leader, and she actually uh, have started this huge group in Latin America for financing, you know, like in order to start talking about finance. So, um, bienvenida. Uh, Sandra, bienvenido, Juan. Uh, before starting, well, I guess I'm going to join them on, on, the, on the table over there uh, before starting all this conversation. But thank you very much for coming. And if you have any question, please write it down because we are going to be, uh, we are gonna be uh, following up and having this exchange with you as well. So I'm going to just go here. Now it's working. Um, Juan, and actually I'm gonna invite you to be a little bit closer. <laughs> yes, you know, um, we are from Latin America and we like to be close as well. So Sandra, you are here on the biggest screen. So first of all, I'm actually going, going to, I'm, I'm not gonna be pretentious. I guess the best people that can share with you what they are doing and how they are contributing to mobilize these resources and look for this capital to address climate change in a context where we are struggling with many different challenges. Uh, I guess the best people to introduce this work is actually our guest. Uh, Juan, Sandra, bienvenidos nuevamente, welcome again. And Juan, please tell us a little bit or a little bit more about what you're doing. I know you're doing a lot, but tell us what you're doing what, what is your organization doing? And uh, um, I don't know if you can share anything else before starting the panel. Uh, thank you everyone for, for being here and, and thank you for the invitation. So very quickly, I, I wear two hats as I sit on this stage. The, the first is on my professional work. I do um, mostly work on climate finance, but also climate risks. Uh, and what I mean by climate risks is in, in incorporating climate related financial risks into financial decision making, mostly in the private sector through the implementation of something called the, uh, the recommendations from the TCFD, the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures, and more recently, the TNFD, the Task Force on Nature Related Financial Disclosures, whereby essentially the, the whole rationale behind that is that there's a fiduciary duty, a legal duty, a liability, for companies and also financial institutions to incorporate climate risk into their decision making. And on the other hand, I work also as uh, the former director now of Pacto por el Clima, an organization youth-led in, in Colombia. Um, and we do a lot of, uh, we work with, with policymakers to introduce climate justice considerations into policymaking. And in particular, we, we try to approach justice 
as the IPCC defines it, more of a procedural justice. How, do, how are decisions being made? And in the case of, of climate finance in particular, more recently been working with the, uh, with the Egyptian government on something called the Sharm El Sheikh Guidebook on Just Financing that will be released uh, during Finance Day at COP uh, in November, where essentially we're trying to incorporate justice into the international uh, climate finance ecosystem. Thank you very much, Juan, and I knew it was a lot, <laughs> as you can see, and thank you for including justice whenever we talk about climate finance. And now I wanna, I wanna give the floor to Sandra Guzman. She's the founder of the Climate Finance Group for the Latin American and the Caribbean region. Um, and the Latin American and the Caribbean region, as you know, has some of the countries that are gonna be the most impacted by the effects of climate change. Sandra, please tell us what you are doing and how you're addressing the, cl the climate finance with the work you do. Excellent, thank you so much. First of all, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you. Thanks for the invitation to be part of this conversation. It's a shame that I'm not gonna be able to be there, but it's, it's, it's my pleasure to be here. Well, I have been working in, in climate finance for the last 16 years and precisely I started working on this, asking the question that you made just a few minutes ago, that where is the money? But I think uh, at that point, when I was trying to understand uh, the international negotiations, as you know, uh, there is this huge uh, need of, of finance to implement mitigation and adaptation actions. And when I went to my first COP, uh, conference of the parties back in 2008, everyone was asking about like, we need more money, we need more money. And, and I started to, to think, well, where is the money? So, but for me, it has been not only understanding where is the money that comes from the international cooperation, which is a critical element, but also what is what our countries are doing with their own money. Uh, uh, so that's why we started working in transparency as a very first step, as a principle to understand, like not only understanding where, where the money is, where it's coming from, but also how the money has been uh, allocated, you know, where, uh, who is actually receiving those resources and what type of changes they are doing. Uh, that's why we are also working not only the transparency side, but I think one of the key debates that we are trying to emphasize is the, the, type, uh, the discussion about effectiveness. Today, we know that more financial flows are growing and are being mobilized from private and public capital. And a lot of people are talking about the mobilization of trillion of dollars, but actually to what extent that financial flows are reducing emissions, to what extent they are actually creating a better adaptation scenarios. And, and I think if we do not assess the effectiveness, then we are going to be just talking about money without actually be transformational. And this is precisely the work that we do in GFLAC is trying to understand not only where is the money, but also understanding how the money has been allocated at the different levels. And that's the motivation. And our hope is that at the end of the day, we are going to support and really comply with Article 2 in the Paris Agreement that really says that all financial flows eventually, not only a few, not only public or private, all financial flows have to be consistent with the low carbon uh, development around the world. So that's our mission and that's what we do every day, trying to support that, uh, that the compliance of that goal. Thank you, Sandra. And it's, it's actually amazing the work that you have been doing. And I guess many of these actions around climate change are born in these spaces where we start discussing. And we start identifying these key questions. Where is the money? What do we do? You know, what is, where is the justice whenever we talk about climate finance or climate change? Where is civic action? Because let's remember this panel is also related to how this climate finance can push civic engagement and civic action. So I know that perhaps we can have a lens of where, what, where we are. You know, what is our context? We see things on the news, we, th we see things on social media, but I'm wondering, you know, because the algorithms sometimes let us see only what we want to see. So I wanna ask Juan and Sandra, you guys that are very um, into this conversation, where we are, what is the current actual context globally? We have many things going on. How do you see it from the lens of climate finance? 
I'd say that, that the, um, the, the, the main premise is understanding why climate justice is at the basis of climate finance. Um, the Copenhagen um, goal of reaching $100 billion per year was not met. The OECD says that around $83 billion were mobilized on a yearly basis in 2020. Um, and we're waiting for a new uh, climate finance target in terms of the amount of financing. And that's born out of the uh, um, common but differentiated responsibility principle in the UNFCCC. However, um, there is something to, to account for, which is procedural justice. A lot of the finance that has been flowing towards developing countries from developed nations has been in the form of debt, has been in the form of uh, financing for large-scale infrastructure, transport, and energy projects, and has also been in the form of essentially perpetuating um, justice structure or power structures, really, that are not consistent with a just world. Um, and to, to pick up on some of the ideas that the IPCC has brought under a definition of procedural justice, justice is on, not only about outcomes, but processes. Um, and in this case, the, the, the new, uh, I would say, the, where we're at is that current processes are not just. The financing flows might be there, but the process of how criteria is determined, how we decide whether to invest on mitigation as most of the money is being spent on and not an adaptation. Even if we talk about adaptation, are we only using, let's say, cost-benefit analysis that would more than likely disregard a large chunk of the population, which might not re uh, represent a big cost because they're poor? Um, that's the kind of questions that we're asking. And then, on the other hand, if we think about more the uh, climate risk approach, which is, is a bit more of a novel approach, as uh, companies, as financial institutions begin to incorporate climate risk into their financial decision making, it is highly likely that a bunch uh, or large sectors of not only populations but, uh, but sectors of the economy are going to be devoid of financing. They're going to be deemed too risky to invest in. So even though, even in, in my own work where I try to um, essentially force companies through regulation to disclose the climate risks that they're exposed to, to some extent, I'm also contributing to the injustice. And I bring this up because the, um, the fact that, that, let's say, smallholder farmers, a, a sector that I've been working on uh, with for the past couple of years, they are more than likely to be, they, they're already outside of the mainstream financial sector and even more if climate risks are, are, are accounted for. So before thinking about solutions, we need to be, we need to understand very precisely where is the injustice. And in this case, it's about risk exposure. It's about who is bearing the risk it's about who is paying not only for the cost of climate change, but the financial cost of climate change for increased, let's say, um, risk in, in credit ratings and how that affects public finances in, in countries. Uh, but then at the end of the day, also who's not getting the money. We don't see uh, climate finance flowing into certain sectors, agriculture being one of them. We don't see climate finance flowing into SMEs. It's mostly to larger companies and then also to smaller municipalities. And let's also remember that uh, the Global South is not only a geographic region, but also a power region. The Global South exists in the North. And it's more uh, talking also about municipalities that have been historically neglected or in the United States redlined. So, it's, so we are right now in a moment where these issues are being raised. And I'm really glad to bring up uh, the, uh, the, the, the title of this whole conference, there is hope. Particularly, I see hope in, in Africa. The, the, the African nations are, able, are being able to come together, something that we Latin Americans haven't done, uh, being able to come together with strong messaging to be able to raise these issues of procedural justice, of the amount of financing, of the quality of financing being offered. And that's going to be one of the main issues being discussed at COP later on this year. Wow. Isn't that your impression? Yes, we are talking about finance, but I guess the money is there. Where is it going? Is it going to the right direction? Thank you, Juan, for answering these questions. You just like opened my mind way more. But I also want to hear from Sandra. Sandra, where are we now? You were mostly with the Latin American and Caribbean region, but I know you're a leader and you have been engaged in these global spaces of decision making for climate change and finance. Please, can you share with us what is your vision of this context, the current context? 
of course. It, well, first of all, it is very important to acknowledge that there is not a universal definition about what climate finance is. And this is the best uh, example to show the complexity that we are facing. We are talking a, a, a lot about different flows, but countries call climate finance to different things. And that makes very, very difficult to really assess where is the money and how much has been transferred. However, a climate policy initiative published uh, last year that for instance, between 2019 and 2020, there was a mobilization of 632 billion of dollars in, in that period. Um, and, and you would think, well, 600, uh, it's six times more than the, the 100 billion that was the, the, the agreement uh, back in Copenhagen. However, the key conversa conversation is that this money that uh, represent these uh, 632 billion are coming from different sources, not only public sources, but also private sources. And as, as was mentioned already, uh, the problem is what type of finance has been transferring. Uh, a lot of the demands from developing countries has been like to start uh, transferring more resources in a form of, of grants because a lot of countries cannot pay back uh, the, the resources that they are accessing. However, most of the, of the instruments that have been used to transfer this money are loans or other type of concessional capital that at the end of the day has to, has to be uh, paid back. And, and that means that uh, a lot of countries are just uh, increasing their, their levels of net debtness. Um, but I think the, the, the important part is also understanding how this distribution of, of the capital has been has been done. Latin America definitely is not the first uh, recept the receptor of, of capital. So if we think in regions, uh, for instance, a lot of resources have been going to Africa, Asia and Pacific, but also in North, in North America, uh, including <clears throat> or, or, uh, certain parts, for instance, in Mexico, obviously. But I think the critical point is that uh, Latin America is the third recipient in terms of uh, if we consider the developing countries regions. But if you go uh, analyze the case of Latin America, only like four or five countries are the main recipients. No? Like not all the countries are receiving the money in the same way. So for instance, we have Mexico, Brazil are the major re recipients. And but we, if you see the, the rest of the region, unfortunately, the, the, the aggregation or the allocation, let's say, of this money is not the same. And if you go to the to the, the distribution across mitigation and adaptation, 90% of the of the finance flows are still uh, allocated in the mitigation side, only 8% in adaptation. And if you consider the levels of vulnerability of our region and other regions, you start believing that what is happening, why adaptation is not part of the main um, in, in terms of the allocation, why? And you, you start to think that, unfortunately, we are thinking in finance is still in the same uh, traditional way. Uh, if, if you are going to invest and generate profit, then it's good. And unfortunately, in the context of, of the mitigation, you can generate profit, you can change technology, you can sell technology to reduce emissions, and that, that will help you to generate profit. But it's, this is not a case of adaptation. Adaptation it may not give you profit straight away uh, or, or as easy as mitigation. And that's why we have to start thinking differently. The paradigm of climate finance has to change. We have to stop thinking only in numbers, but we have to start thinking in transformational approaches. We know that the model that we have so far based on extractive activities is not helping us, but still a lot of our countries in Latin America, Asia and Africa are still investing a lot of money in fossil fuels. Uh, but it's because their, their, their income, their economies depend a lot in their revenue of fossil fuels to pay for health, social, social uh, well-being, education and others. So that's why I think it, it's a moment to transform the paradigms and really start investing in the transformational approach to change the type of economies that we have around the world. And obviously that will need a lot of investments and not only uh, like 600 billion, but we are talking about trillions. And of course we have to mainstream climate change in all the financial system, public and private, if we really want to tackle the, the crisis that we have at the moment. So this is, this is the size of the problem at the moment. And obviously it's in our hands to also push like the actors to, to the right direction. Thank you very much, Sandra, for, for opening our eyes as well on this, in these terms, because we're not talking about billions, we're talking about trillions, and the money is there. 
you know, and we need more money, but we need to put it on the right places. And something that um, you're making me think with your responses, with your response, Juan and Sandra, is um, we need then this money or this uh, financial capital then to generate a transformation that can allow us or as communities, as countries, to have the tools to respond to the climate, to the climate crisis, but also to adapt, uh, and not necessarily the resources that increase our debt and make us even more vulnerable at some point in the middle or long term. Uh, we need this financial capital to help us to develop the right tools, the right skills, the right infrastructure, and the right assets in order to be able to address this and, 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 and cover all the expenses that this uh, very uh, big challenge, uh, what, what is, is the climate crisis in our countries, really mean for the, for the people no? and for the nation. So thank you very much for, for these responses. Um, but, uh, and Sandra actually gave a very nice introduction to the next question uh, regarding the paradigms. You know, uh, we have been talking about justice, where the money is going, that the current um, assets or, or, or the, the current uh, fi finance or climate finance is perpetuating some injustice uh, and the, the different gaps that we are actually being fighting and that we were able to see during COVID um, more clearly, actually. Um, so what are these new paradigms that we need to consider? when we talk about climate, climate finance and how we can connect these with citizen engagement. I'd say that, that there's two opportunities to do that. On, on the one hand, um, a, a big challenge in climate finance is understanding that th the question is never if the money is there, the money exists. It's about who's getting the money and what's being prioritized. And to some extent, something that I myself hear time and again, it's we don't have projects to invest in. There's not enough projects, we don't see them. And they do exist, so what, what's the, where's the gap? And to some extent, on both in the private sector and the public sector, the gap is a capacity gap. Um, and if you look at the, some of the calculations from, let's say, organizations such as NDC Partnership, a lot of the climate finance needed to uh, implement NDCs is not in developing projects. It's about developing local capacity to be able to propose those projects, to be able to develop them, to be able to locally prioritize what the needs are. And here, I, I think it's, it's where the, par the first paradigm shift ne needs to come in. The Global South has historically been the playground for the ideas of people in New York, in London, in Paris, and other cities. That's unfair <laughs> on many levels. That's absurd. Um, and it's, it's, it's really a, an inheritance of, of, of colonial's way of, of, of approaching development. So if we think of, of civic engagement in particular, a lot of the, uh, of the real prioritization and understanding of where risk lies and where needs are in terms of both development and risk mitigation, it's on grassroots organizations. But again, these rats, grassroots organizations don't tend to have A, the axis, and B, the, um, the resources to have the capacities to formulate their own projects. And that's where one big uh, part of, of what's being currently proposed is increase the fin grant financing, not debt, uh, to develop capacities. That's a big issue in the Global South. Capacity, capacity is, I wouldn't say everything, but a big part of the equation. And civil society needs to be part of A, asking those questions, and B, being able to receive those funds and build their own capacity, because if local voices are not talking in the terms that the financial world is using, they're gonna be left out. The, the financial world is moving with or without them. And I think that's a, a sobering realization that we need to come to terms with is that the, we may be able to reach a net zero world, maybe not, but we may uh, reach a net zero world in 2050 that is profoundly unjust. How do we get there? with a profoundly just world? I think that's the question. Um, and then, on the other hand, it's, I, I think it's also about um, understanding that in climate finance, we don't only act in the public sector. 
we as individuals have power as private sector individuals, as, as actors in, in the marketplace. And in particular, um, and I think the UK actually has a, a very good uh, uh, a track record on this, large pension funds, for example, are the holders usually of the, the vast majority of assets under management in developed and developing economies. And there's a big case for, for, um, for, uh, for people who benefit from these pension funds. I myself contribute to a private pension fund in Colombia to, uh, to raise our hands and say, where is my money going to? Is my money funding deforestation? Is my money funding climate change? Because they have the duty to not only tell me if this money is going to that, but also tell me if my money is at risk. And this is where the, the climate risk consideration comes in. If my own pension money is investing in something that will not give me a future, healthy future for, for myself, they're essentially not uh, complying with their fiduciary duty, which is to act in my own best interests. And I think that tension there is something key to, to bring up because we, we tend to think only in political terms when we think of climate justice, but we can also think as market actor terms, which might, might seem a bit contradictory, but I think it's not. Thank you, Juan, and again, wow. <laughs> I guess that's, that, and just like thinking on what you're saying, we need to think about also transparency and access to information regarding where this financial capital is going and how the existing capital it's being utilized and how perhaps this is actually increasing the problem. So I think that's very important and that actually makes me remember um, about one specific agreement that we are working on or we are actually um, advocating as the Millennials Movement, myself, um, is the ESCASU agreement. And I don't know if you have heard about it, but it's actually the first environmental agreement in the Latin American and Caribbean region that focus on access to information and participation, as well as the defense of the human rights of environmental defenders. It's the first one. But actually, it's the first in the Latin American and Caribbean region, our first environmental agreement. But it's, uh, it's also the first one in the world that puts the word human rights of environmental defenders. So I guess these kind of different um, assets or processes um, interconnect and can help us to not only make the question, not only demand it outside on the street, but also access to information, engage, participate, access to these financial capitals, and take action. Because as you said, it's a problem of everyone. It's not necessarily the problem of uh, you know, some very important people in, in, in these very high level spaces. It's actually the issue of everyone. So, and I want to ask the same question to Sandra. So, Sandra, um, how, these, um, how are these new paradigms? What do you see in your work? You're working in, one, in a very, very complicated region, the Latin American and Caribbean region. Um, what are these new paradigms that you want to see or do you consider that are important whenever we talk about fly, finance, uh, climate finance and how these can contribute to civic engagement as well? Of course, thank you so much. Uh, first of all, I would like to start uh, saying that it is really interesting and, and actually quite fascinating to participate in different scenarios because, uh, for instance, when you are working at the local level with different actors or uh, different uh, entities that are developing pro projects, uh, the projects are there. And they are always saying, I have the project, I, I have the, the, um, all the, the estimation, I have everything, but I don't find the, the funds. Then you go to the financial community to, and with the banks and the multilateral banks and all different actors and they say the money is there. So it is clear that there is a miscommunication, a misconnection uh, between the, the providers of financial capital as well as with the developers. It's not true and I would, I would disagree in the point that um, it, there are no projects, there are a lot of projects and I receive projects every single day, like looking for finance and looking for opportunities to, to receive uh, support. I think there is a lot of um, uh, work in, in terms of, of, the, of the development of, of these projects. But I would say that it is a problem of access to these financial flows because 
It is true that local communities and developers have to understand how the financial system works, but the financial system also has to understand how this work, uh, how this uh, implementation side works in the ground. Because what we are facing in the, in the financial system in general is that access to these financial flows is very difficult. It's very bureaucratic. It's very limited. For instance, if you want to access, not only I'm not only talking about like big scale, you know, like big big numbers in terms of capital, but I'm also talking about funds in the Green Climate Fund, which is this fund that was created to support developing countries in the implementation of adaptation and mitigation projects. Even access to those funds is very, very difficult for many countries, obviously for many, even small enterprises or other different type of, of, of factors. So I think it is very important to start connecting a, a, and start creating those a, a understanding between the different actors, because I don't think that they are speaking the same language and every single actor has a different interest. And, and that's why I think this is where we have to start thinking in the transformational paradigm as an opportunity to build those bridges, to create those synergies and those co in that coordination among the different actors to start bringing them in the same, in the same space, in the same uh, scenario, because it is true that if you are in the international negotiations on climate change, the negotiations, uh, the, the negotiators that are there are related to certain uh, type of language in terms of climate change, but if in, in climate finance, but if you go with the financial uh, sector, uh, they understand something different. So I think in terms of the of the paradigm, first of all, we have to start thinking with the transformational side as everyone, we are all working towards one goal, which is the stabilization of the of the emissions to avoid an increase in temperature of more than one degree, uh, two degrees, ideally only 1.5. So that's a, a very important um, scenario. And now is how we are going to translate all that, uh, all those goals into our daily life, into our daily uh, policies, into our daily regulations. And I think this is where we have to start thinking about in finance uh, as, as a way to really unlock other actions at the different levels. And this is where I find very important the participation of civil society and all different actors at, in the society because for many years, a, a lot of people thought that climate finance or it's only for experts on finance. But actually I, I, I would say that if there is one agenda that is extremely uh, democratic that needs to be, needs the participation of, of people, uh, it's the finance side. So you, as as a as a citizen, you need to understand where the where your country is investing their money, how the the, the resources are arriving to those uh, that are uh, needing this money. So the decisions that we take every day, not not only as voters, because you can vote uh, for those that have the best proposals in terms of how to allocate the budget. For instance, in GFLAG, we we analyze the budget of twenty one countries every year. Uh, the major emitters in Latin America, we analyze to what extent they are mainstreaming climate change in their budget allocation. And you would, you would be very surprised about like really understanding that many, very, very few countries are actually incorporating climate change in their budget expenditure. So if you are a citizen of your country, like asking where is the money, how the money has been allocated, but also as my colleague was saying, in your daily life, if you have five pesos and you want to buy something, you have to decide where to invest that money because at the end of the day, that money will be part of, of all the system. So I think it's um, the transformational side of this is really start embracing that climate change is something that is real, is here, is going to cost to all of us. You all, we, me, everyone is actually paying already for the droughts, for the hurricanes, for all the events that we are so, uh, viewing and facing, even for the war. That between Russia and Ukraine, we are paying for it uh, through the through the increase in the cost of the fossil fuel. So, it's we are in this world where we all have a role to play. And in terms of the financial side, we all have to be part of that, pushing our governments to invest more in where it's really needed. And as you said, transparency is critical. Like how we are going to push for more uh, sustainable investments and for less carbon-intensive investments, and really start pushing our governments to do those transformational changes from, from the bottom. Thank you, Sandra. And it's, it's very 
important what you mentioned on how we can use this financing for engaging people. And something that actually happened, uh, and perhaps not many people know about this, is that this year we have um, a huge mobilization for the biodiversity process. We have the UNEA, Estocolmo Plus 50, and one of the main things that I can um, take from that process is how, I mean, we work with youth, so how youth was engaged. Uh, something that I really uh, appreciate of the process is that youth was able to participate with the support of the United Nations, in this case of uh, UNEP, um, they were able to engage in the whole process. And I think that is important when we talk about also civic engagement and financing their participation, their say in these decision making spaces. It's important not just to uh, civic engagement, civic engagement washing, <laughs> the civic engagement washing approach, you know? Yes, we take them to the event. Oh, that's amazing. They participate, they feel a seat. You know, they were on the protest. Yes, we bought them like some banners. No, no, no. Actually, which is important is whenever we talk about citizen engagement, is to help them to engage in the whole process from and give the resources for that to happen. And in the case of the young people, it was the government of Finland, but also uh, other member states and the UN allocating resources for them to participate at the global level. There were many uh, youth dialogues delivered in the territories. Then youth was able to not only engage on their national consultations, but also to uh, participate on the preparatory processes, being in Estocolm, being in Nairobi, you know, and being part of the decision making, having the resources to help young people to take action and can or, or, or uh, can, yeah, canalize this, um, these protests, these demands in actual spaces where they can have recommendations, where they can put this on a paper, in a document, and send it to the different member states, include those recommendations on the discussions with member states, engage with them, and generate something that it's important when we think about climate change and civic engagement, and also climate finance, that is empathy and solidarity. Because we are not gonna understand where to put our finances or our money if we don't understand who needs it and how to use it. But in order to do that, we need to have empathy with the different stakeholders to understand where the money needs to go and uh, act with solidarity to understand that this is not necessarily one uh, big investment on the big um, institutions but it's actually solidarity with the, with the Global South, with the people, and with the different stakeholders. So, and I, I know that um, here we have participants from different regions. I mean, we are not in Latin America, but uh, considering that the three of us are from Latin America, um, I would really like to ask both of you, uh, Juan and Sandra, um, and remembering that, again, Latin America and the Caribbean region so I know it's, it's hard because I really love my region, but we need to be also open about this. We are the most violent region in the world, the most unequal region in the world, and the most deathful for environmental defenders globally. So I want to know your perspective on what is coming for our region. How do you think we can perhaps um, uh, think about or canalize these um, uh, finance, this financial support to respond as a region to the different challenges that climate crisis is bringing and to the unjust context that we are also facing. Yes, of course. These are not, not working, but um, I, I'd say that it, this all boils down to the Escazú agreement, actually. And, and the reason I say that is because Colombia is, is the most dangerous country in the world to be an environmental defender. I have the privilege to be here and, and be able to speak my mind freely without fearing for my life. I go down the street and everything's fine. Not Friends of mine in Colombia, if they do that, they get death threats. And if they sometimes get death threats, they might get killed. And this might is a high probability of getting killed to speaking out for anything. Whether that, whatever they're speaking about is factually right or wrong, it doesn't matter. 
the, the mere fact that they, they're going to speak about something, usually opposing large extractive industry projects, is in and of itself a problem that blends pretty nicely with um, the climate finance issue. Because if financing flows are essentially going to promote the development of certain uh, types of, uh, of, of projects, we need to think. Sure, they might be adapting a community to climate change. Sure, they might be uh, mitigating climate change. But are they part of the whole power struggle that exists where some are making decisions for others and those others are not only not being accounted for, but actively threatened and killed? Um, and I think in, in Latin America, we've, the, the, the reason the Escazú Agreement exists on the first place is because we understand that this is happening. And not only we understand, but we feel it. It's our reality. It's what we do every single day. We need to think about safety. Not myself, but people who are there on the front lines. And I'm not on the front lines. I'm, I'm sitting here in New York very comfortably. Um, and then and I, I also think it's, it's, it's a matter of, of, uh, of getting to not only solidarity that we get from developed nations, but solidarity amongst ourselves. Latin America, being so unequal, has also created this, this um, culture of, of, uh, of, of, of classism where there's huge discrimination, not necessarily based on race, but definitely based on class. And here's where we, we need to think about procedural justice. Is a project that is going to be developed, quote, community-led, because someone just sat down next to the minister of whatever and said, and nodded? Is that community participation? Or is understanding that communities need, A, to have the tools, B, to have the voices, and C, to be involved at the origin of a project, not at the end because they need to check off a, a checklist and, and be like, oh yeah, they, they participated, they nodded their heads and they say everything's all right. Um, and I think youth in particular, youth is, is, is driving social movement in, in Latin America right now, particularly as we've seen it in Brazil, we're seeing it in Colombia with the new president. We're seeing it in Chile with the new president. And I bring uh, the president of Chile's actually words yesterday here at Colombia, Gabriel Boric. He says something that I, I think is key, and it's that youth is not valuable because they're youthful. <laughs> youth is not valuable because they're younger. That's not where the value of youth lies. And I think, in my, in my opinion, that the, the value that we have in youth is people who are currently studying. And here's where, where I think my generation is valuable. I'm the first generation that is able to study sustainable development in college. All the people at the World Bank, at the IFC, at the IMF, who are doing this policy, sustainability and climate and all these things are an afterthought to what they've done for decades. And we're the first generation who are able to have the tools to be able to then participate in decision making. And here's where, where I think it's more powerful. It's youth climate activism must not and should never stay on the streets. It should go into spaces where decisions are being made. And to be able to go there, we need to have the tools. And in Latin America, we need to do that by building the capacity, by building the tools, by reaching, not waiting for um, underprivileged communities to come to the opportunities, but actively extending those opportunities who need them, to those who need them. I think that's what's key, and uh, to, to close we need to learn from our peers in the Global South. I think in, in, in particular, Southeast Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa are doing a brilliant job in coming together to be able to propose ambitious, technically rigorous, and also sometimes youth-led initiatives to propose solutions, to be able to come to the table with clear numbers. Particularly, we'll see that in Egypt. The, the African Development Bank is, is thinking of, of proposing a, a $2 trillion um, goal to be able to finance African countries and DCs. The IDB has the goal for Latin America from a, a, a bit old paper of, of around 214 billion. That's a joke. That's a, 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 that's nothing, that's air. And again, why don't we have a regional number? Because we don't talk amongst ourselves. And I think if we're swimming against the current, we better be in a group, not by ourselves. Otherwise we'll drown. This is solidarity, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Juan. And, and I'm gonna make a pass here, and I'm pretty sure you all have phones, right? 
Do you have Instagram or Facebook? Okay, I'm gonna make a quick request. Get your phone and look for this person. Um, Alejandro Vera, oh, no, I'm sorry, Francisco Vera. Francisco Vera, you might find a person that is very young with glasses, Francisco Vera. Look it on your social media, Francisco Vera. Yeah, it's Francisco Vera is V-E-R, V as Victor. I don't know if you can find it, he has like thousands of followers. <laughs> yeah, V E R O, sorry, A, yes, sorry. V E R A, yes, Francisco. Yes, you find uh, here, she find it? Huh? No, it's a kid, it's a kid. It's a kid, it's a very young person. Francisco Vera, you can, you found it, you found it, yeah. Many people have found it. So, just coming to the point of Juan, he was saying how important you is. And for me, Francisco is one of the main examples on how resilient our region is. As Juan mentioned, whenever we are activists and we want to engage on these kind of issues, such as climate change, we can sometimes get like life threats. And actually Francisco, who has started to be an activist whenever he was six years old, he got death threats for his activism. But you know what? The great example is that he's a seed and he just flourished. Now he's one of the biggest activists that we have. And if before, when I was asked, where is the Latin American Greta Thunberg? And I used to say, I don't know, or perhaps because we are the most full region in the world for environmental defenders, it might be dead. Now I can say that within all the, the difficulties and very complex uh, context that we live into, we have people like Francisco that is mobilizing millions of people and talking with decision makers globally to actually take action for climate change. And that is the value on youth their resilience, their action, their capacity to congregate and communicate people. I'm just gonna go with this last question, and, and I know we are running over time, and I just wanna hear from Sandra. Sandra, please tell us like, what is the context for the region, for Latin America, in terms of uh, uh, climate finance, uh, and we are starting the wrap up of the session. Sandra, we are with you. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think I, I would like to start a really trying to, to bring back a, the, the story, uh, the, the history of the region. A, and the big problem is that our region is still very much embedded in, a, in this extractive and, and fossil fuel a based a economy. Um, around all our countries, there is still a lot of, um, you know, investments on, on coal, uh, oil and gas because it's kind of part of the of the tradition that uh, the, that our region basically adopted from 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 in, uh, industrial uh, economies. But I think this is important to to really understand how the economy of our countries uh, work because, I, as I was saying most of them or a lot of them rely on, on, on fossil fuels to generate revenue. Even Costa Rica, they sell um, gasolina in, in it's a, like fuel and it's how they re generate revenue. Which is telling us is that we have to really start rethinking the way that we are doing things. And I think one of the biggest opportunities that the region has is to really start putting value in somewhere else. And if we believe, if we if we go back and observe that our region is the most uh, rich region in terms of uh, ecosystem biodiversity, so rich in terms of uh, all the different uh, landscapes that our region has. So I'm always uh, wondering why we are not investing in protecting the jungle, why we are not investing in generating new jobs around the protection of all these these different ecosystems. Um, you know that, for instance, in, in the Amazon, there is a lot of discussion about a, a lot of companies, all companies that want to deforestate the, the, the Amazon to really dig and extract more petroleum, more, more oil, more gas, more. A, and, and the big question is why? Why we need that a, economy? We have to start moving on, a, but that requires a lot of willingness, political willingness, and as um, we have been hearing in the in the latest speeches, even Petro, the president of Colombia, 
was very clear about the challenges, but also is, is, is that willingness, political willingness, of course, like it's a decision and the political system has to decide to change the, the, the scenario. And I think um, what I observe at least uh, with hope is that we have now more leaders in the region as Boric, uh, of course, Petro uh, and other leaders that are thinking in the environmental side, not only as, a, as, a, as an independent agenda, but as part of the critical problems of all the economies in Latin America. So I think um, one element that I always think is we have to rethink and we have to really embrace the richness that we have in the region, work together, because obviously you have a lot of a uh, connection no? in Central America. You have, all, of, of course, all the countries that are around the Amazon. You have all different regions that you really can bring them together to, to work. Um, and what I would like to emphasize is that definitely at the civil society level, at the youth level, there is more and more uh, interest, but the youth and the children are going out there because they are witnessing what is happening. And, and I think this is, this is very important to, to say, they are living in a completely different world. Even me, uh, my generation, uh, when I was growing, uh, I, I didn't hear about climate change as often as they are doing now. So they are uh, growing out in a completely different uh, scenario. They, and this is taking them outside and taking the streets. But I, I really want to emphasize the, the point that now seems like everyone is saying, ah, it's great that the youth is it's out there. But actually, we would really feel like uh, angry that we got to this point where youth are having to leave their, their schools, as Greta is saying always, like, why are they have the ones that have to leave their school to really um, push for decisions because the actual governments are not doing their job. So I think we have to not necessarily romanticize like the role of youth, but actually listen, listen what they are doing and taking them, as my colleague was saying, to the tables to, to really uh, um, take decisions instead of romanticize the role that youth is having. It's actually giving them the tools to be part of the decision making and not only like looking them, um, yeah, like walking around. And, and I would like to, to close this point saying that the pandemic led us a lot of lessons uh, and one of the main lessons uh, is that if we, did, if we don't invest on time, these problems will increase. So it's going to be far more expensive to avoid action than if we start acting right now. Uh, there is a lot of uncertainty, of course, but we know how much it costs. Unfortunately, in Latin America, we, we still need to do more assessments about what's the cost of adaptation and mitigation actions. But we have a lot of information about where where the actions are needed. So now it's a matter of not only creating national strategies on climate finance, but also bring different actors together and, and, and really start working towards a, a, a very important transformation of our economies and really decouple our, our well-being from fossil fuels and really, really start valuing nature uh, as, as, as the full and not only as, as something that uh, from the economic perspective, not natural resources. No, it's nature, nature. We, let's let's really value nature in the full, full, full package. Um, and yeah, and of course in Latin America, we have a lot of opportunities to work together. Uh, as as uh, my colleague was saying, we, we have this opportunity to transform. And if we don't do it now, uh, this, um, yeah, unfortunately we are gonna be too late. We only have eight years to reduce significantly emissions. And it, to do that, we have to invest crazy amounts of money, but particularly changing our framework and, and our mindset to, to invest where, where it really is needed. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. And I'm very impressed with your with all your inputs. And before going into the question and answer, I really want to make a pause here because we actually were talking about youth, our, our power, our mobilization. And I want to invite some amazing activists, youth activists that are actually with us today to come to the stage because they actually have a message for you. After this message, we go back to the question and answers in case you have one. And in other case, we cannot keep joining the amazing uh, break over there that we have with coffee and croissants but come over here yes and we have this is youth this is what we are actually doing and you can see youth from all over the world so come girls yes um, hi everyone yes maybe let's just move a little bit Oh, okay. 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 So we can maybe sit down. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, hi everyone, my name is Dominika Lasota, I'm a climate justice activist from Poland and um, uh, we're all part of Fridays for Future, Poland, Ukraine, um, Uganda and us in Victoria, we're Polish. Um, and we know this is a, a closing session and I know we're running a little bit late um, as the climate strike, the global climate strike is supposed to start at 2 p.m. So um, we might need to rush a little bit because obviously our duty calls and we cannot miss the strike. And obviously I welcome and invite you all to join that. But before that, we thought that um, there have been some amazing speakers throughout today, and I'm sure during this climate week you've heard so many um, leaders, politicians maybe not, but um, uh, youth um, and uh, indigenous um, and just community organizers from across the world. We're coming in with our stories, and um, we hope that you know with that power um, you're able to um, to join us. Most importantly, but also to see that you know there are some incredible um, voices from across the world that are very bold when it comes to the fossil fuel industry, and very bold at the moment also um, about dictators from around the world. And we're not here just to, you know, put the youth sticker to this event, um, to, you know, or we're not here to be your inspiration and so that you can smile and be more optimistic about the future. We're coming here, we have some important things to say, but most importantly, we want you to join us. So um, with me today is Victoria Bo, who is an Ukrainian activist a member of Fridays for Future Ukraine, and I would love to for her to start us off um, with her perspective, since Victoria and many other of our friends from Fridays for Future Ukraine, since seven months, have been living under the condition of full-scale Russian invasion that is fueled directly by the fossil fuel industry of Russia. So off to Victoria. Thank you very much. Oh, how do you? Hello. So my name is Victoria Bull, and I'm a climate and health justice activist from Ukraine. Uh, from the very first days of the full-scale invasion of my home country, I have been helping mobilize the Fridays for Future youth climate movement to call for the toughest sanctions, the full embargo on Russian oil and gas. I've been working particularly in the UK, where I live now, on the Pumping for Putin campaign against companies selling Russian crude oil products. And this is our target because 40% of the Russian federal budget comes from oil and gas. And they are financing this war thanks to inaction by our leaders. Every, every voice for the embargo has been a voice to save a life from genocide by a terrorist petrostate. As one of our activists in occupied Ukraine has told us, it is not only human lives um, that, that can be spared but whole Ukrainian ecosystems currently threatened by, um, um, by militarist ecocide as forests burned in ignored fires from, from, from ignored fires from airstrikes. Coal mines are flooded and water is polluted by the Russian occupiers. And the embargo is just the first most basic step in um, towards curing our world's fossil fuel addiction. This fight needs to continue because the fossil fuel industry backing wars is a poisonous monster fed by corrupt financial inst institutions and allowed for by our leaders. The likes of JP Morgan, Citibank and HSBC are financing oil companies still trading Russian fossil fuels, enabling Russia's imperialist war crimes and accelerating the path to uh, bypass the critical 1.5 degrees of global heating, which will unleash unforeseen positive feedback loops of climate disaster. The only choice is to boycott these profiteering corporations. But by, by continuing to invest in even American oil, oil and gas companies, the US is also enabling the growth of trade and financial infrastructure that are used by a raping and murdering regime to colonize Ukraine, to colonize Georgia, Syria, and others. This is a regime that also, once again, threatens our world with nuclear disaster. And I know how nuclear disaster destroys lives. It destroys, destroys the world, because my mother and my grandparents 
were part of the evacuation of their home city of Chernobyl in 1986, and they had to pay the price in their health. And how has the Russian regime compensated uh, for uh, the government mandated lies about their diagnoses of radiation disease and the deaths of, of their friends. 36 years after their silenced trauma, my grandparents have had to leave their home for the second time. And this time, they have had to leave their homes because of a fossil fuel war. A fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty can help prevent the uprooting the broken health and the erasure of more communities. It is already backed by the WHO, over 200 health organizations, and nearly 70 cities, and as announced today for the first time, the first country of Vanuatu. To prevent escalation of global climate, energy, food, human rights crises, our fossil fuel dependence must end now. So join us and let's mobilize our climate hope and ambition in demanding the toughest trade embargoes on fossil fuel dictators on divest uh, and mobilize against di uh, for divestment from fossil fuel destruction and for climate finance to enable a just renewable transition that is decoupled from corrupt expansionism. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Hilda Flavia Nakavie, and I'm a Ugandan climate activist. I am also a founder at Uganda's Fridays for Future Movement and a fellow with a US-based organization called Gar Rising. Uh, so today, I just want to tell you about the East African crude oil pipeline. It's a pipeline that is operated by Total Energies, which is a French company. And this pipeline is going to pass through my village. I come from the Uganda uh, in the basin of Lake Victoria. Lake Victoria is the biggest freshwater body in freshwater boat lake in Africa and the second biggest in the world. My village is close to this lake and this pipeline is going to destroy my village. I'm here to tell you that we should all stand up and uh, support this campaign to stop the East African crude oil pipeline because it's already destroying our lives. It has destroyed our property, it has destroyed our plantations, and we cannot go on living like this. This pipeline will be 1,445 kilometers long, starting from a place called Hoima in Uganda and to the port of Tanga, in Tanzania, so it's passing through two different countries. It will be crossing over 200 rivers. Yeah, it will be passing through different uh, wetlands, through different swamps, different forests, national reserves, game parks, and over 400 oil wells have been discovered in a national game park, and that's where this company wants to drill its oil. My country is gifted with nature, and the British called it the Pearl of Africa. It's this beautiful nature that draws the people to come and visit my country. But with pipelines like this being constructed in our national parks, it will destroy our environment. We are agriculturalists. We are not oil producing countries. And that is why we need each and every one of you to join us and stand together with us in putting an end to this pipeline. I am telling you this, sharing my hopes, my fears, my stress with you because I believe in the power of the people. I believe if people come together, they can make a great difference. I believe in what people say because they know exactly how it feels. So um, I want to tell you that there have been actions done in different countries around the world against the East African crude oil pipeline. We have uh, groups of campaigners and activists helping all throughout, and we want to see more growing in other different countries or regions. And there will be actions the 28th uh, of September in front of the Stock Exchange in New York, and I hope all of you can join us there. Thank you. Uh, 
I, I feel like this is very hard to speak after Hilda and after the story of Eco because I, I think that what Total is, is trying to do in, in Uganda right now and in Tanzania, it shows very clearly what exactly fossil fuel industry has been doing for years for our life, you know, with our lives. And um, I shouldn't be here, Xie was supposed to be here, but she, she didn't make it. So I would try to somehow link the stories that we're telling it turn to you right now. To, to show how these overlapping crises that we are fighting right now, so on one hand, the war in Ukraine, on the other hand, climate crisis, the energy crisis that is upcoming and, and for sure will be very, very seen and very uh, visible around the world. For example, in Poland, in the country that I come from as well, uh, in these very different places, we have this very different crisis, and to these crises, we need a variety of solutions. And to have this variety of solutions, we need a variety of vo voices, as well as a variety of stories that we carry, carry with ourselves. And what, to me, was, um, I think, the most striking last half a year was the fact that, you know, um, when you think about, okay, so there's like an oil pipeline that's gonna displace people and destroy everything for like lives of, for, uh, for people in Uganda and Tanzania, and then there's war in, in, in Europe, in Eastern Europe, in the biggest country in Europe. Okay, so we have two different, different problems, and where's the link between them? And the link is very clear for us as climate activists, because this link is fossil fuel industry, and the fact that we are so heavily dependent on fossil fuels. And to me, when I hear so many leaders, including leaders who are very, you know, very helpful and very open to tackle the war in Ukraine, for example, when I hear them speaking about the war and not mentioning fossil fuels at all, I know that they are hypocrites. And all of these leaders that are right now attending the UNGA have haven't had the enough courage to say what really is the source of all of this crisis and what really is the source of all of these ends of the words for me, but for Hilda, for Dominika, for Victoria, and for many, many activists and people that are, you know, in this room, but also that are right now hitting the street in New York and all around the world. And to me, what I would really like to highlight, I think, is that we really need a variety of these stories to, to show that fossil fuel industry has been so overwhelmingly killing our people and our lives every day, and we have to stop them. And without stopping fossil fuel industry at all, we cannot, you know, we cannot ensure peace, we cannot ensure justice, we cannot ensure all of these different things that we are sure, surely fighting for. So just wanted to show that link, and we'll pass it on to uh, my, my friend Dominica. Um, and just to, to kind of finish us off, since, as I mentioned, we will be leaving for the global climate strike to, to, to oppose, to protest, to resist there collectively, um, I wanted to just quickly kind of um, something that I was thinking about as, as, um, as all the incredible activists were speaking, is that people like Victoria, a Ukrainian citizen, the fossil fuel industry, Putin, and all of those behind the Russian invasion wouldn't like her to be here. Because to them, what they want to achieve is a genocide. People like Hilda aren't welcomed, and you know, I think Total Energies and those behind the French neocolonization wouldn't like Hilda to be here. Because to them, the lives of Ugandans, Tanzanians, mean very little. To them, what means the most is profit that they can get from digging into the ground, from displacing communities like Hilda's community, just to make as much money as possible in the collapsing era of fossil fuels. And so in a way, the fact that we are all here and that we every day we resist and we build resistance across the world against the fossil fuel industry, that is a threat in itself towards the industry to whom human lives mean nothing. The bombs that are falling in Ukraine and the carbon bombs that are disrupting the lives of people in East Africa have the same root. The fossil fuel industry and toxic politicians who are complicit to that industry and who put profit over people since decades. And I want to make it clear, because I think for many of us, the crises that we're now experiencing, the wars that we are hearing about or experiencing ourselves, they are so overwhelming that sometimes 
those behind them want us to give up under the immense threat and the immense fear that all of their aggression, violence, exploitation cause. And so us, for us, pointing very directly to the root of the, this problem is a way to overcome that overwhelmness, that fear, and to build resistance. Because we know by tackling the root of this problem, we are able to build coalitions that will put an end to the fossil fuel era. And so with all of these stories, I think, um, what I would like to leave you with is, um, I think, the fact that we might be on to finally um, the root of, of those multiple crises. And we are, might be witnessing um, the growth, the rise up of one of the most incredible resistance, love resistance towards the industry and the system that aims at destruction. And so I would only ask you, don't watch us, don't look at us, join us if you haven't joined yet. If you are with us, I can only be grateful to your power because you know, it helps us a lot. And it makes us, um, I wouldn't say more hopeful because I'm not sure what hope means to me anymore if our friends are dying at the front line in Ukraine. Um, but it is power that, is, that, 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 that moves um, mountains. And to fin finish with, I feel, obviously, we couldn't come here without our banners. So we have a little for the memories, if we could take a picture with our incredible banners um, and invite you to join the Global Climate Strike. That would be my biggest pleasure and privilege. And thank you for that. Can you give us details on where to meet? Yes, so the climate strike is starting at Folly Square at 2 p.m. So that gives us exactly half an hour to get there, <laughs> if you'd be interested. Yes. So just to finish us off, um, a few messages. Oppose ECOP, the world's longest oil pipeline in the making by, total Fre by French oil giant Total Energies. Stand with the Ukrainians who are fighting and who are building what might be one of the biggest fossil fuel war resistance in the world at the moment. Always remember about the fact that oil, coal, and gas equals war of the industry of the system against the people, and that this industry aims at killing us all and threatening all of our lives. And so don't look at us, just join us. <laughs> Christian, for, for making this panel happen, right? You put this together uh, in a second, so thank you so much. Uh, I want to enjoy, uh, I want to invite back Rosario to finish her panel, and then I'll let you all go and enjoy your Friday and enjoy the strike and get together with them um, for more force. Thank you, and actually, as you can see, that is solidarity, and that is the people where the finance needs to go. You know, that is the people that we need to be included, and this is the actions that we actually need to take. But before to finish, I will read John, and thank you uh, for, you know, we are Latin Americans, we, we are very flexible, and, you know, we like chaos. So, <laughs> so, well, First of all, I just wanted to thank a lot Juan and Sandra for being here. I guess I cannot be, on, be the only one saying that their message and their knowledge was very, very um, broad. And I hope that their uh, inputs may, may you think about climate finance in a different way. May you understand that the money is there and may you understand that you need to act so the money is going to the right way without perpetuating different kind of gaps or structural gaps that is there are creating more injustice in the world. So Juan and Sandra, thank you very much for joining us, but also thank you for your flexibility 
and showing that millennials, we are also, you know, we like solidarity. And if we were demanding solidarity to the older generations, now is our time to show that we need to support, you know, the new generations coming. Generation Z and all these young people, you know, taking action to fight climate change. So with that, I don't know if there is a last question or a comment from the public before we leave, but I will really thank you all already for joining us, for your flexibility, and also for being interested on these topics. So I will perhaps open the floor if there is any question or contribution from the public. There is one here, yes. Hello, thank you very much. Um, I feel very lucky to be here. And also my last name is Guzman, so I feel like we're a big family. Wow. Um, I'm gonna ask the same question I asked the last panel because I think it's more appropriate for this discussion. So how can we share the responsibility of guaranteeing equal access to climate capital for countries or regions where we know that the climate crisis is pushing beyond adaptation? Um, on a financial sense, I know that this is something that's being debated and I'm really wondering what's your stance on this? I'd say very quickly, um, oof, it's, a, it's a big question. I, I would say that under the like, formal definition of, of loss and damage financing, that's where it comes in because, well, some interpretations of loss and damage is towards those communities that, are, that will be un, or have been unable to adapt and won't be able to because it's physically impossible to do it or maybe way too expensive that it to be even be considered. Um, I think the, the, what um, the climate envoy John Kerry said two days ago at the New York Times uh, panel thing on climate uh, is a bit unfortunate. He, he mentioned that, he, he said, where are the trillions gonna come from? And then you have President Biden some months ago proposing a $763 billion uh, budget for the army in the US and for the, for the military. So, I mean, I think it's, it's, a, it's a politically uh, nascent f area, and, and what I mean by nascent, loss and damage has been around for decades, but it's entering the mainstream. And I think we need to push even more to make, that, make those discussions happen, because they haven't happened. Um, I wouldn't say there's an answer to that. What I say is the numbers are there. I think what we need to start conveying now is the emotion and the political need for this to happen. Because, I mean, we know that climate change is not about communicating facts. It's about communicating realities, emotions, and political willingness. Thank you, Juan. And I don't know if, Sandra, you have an input for this question. Yes, you do. Yes, definitely. Thank you so much. Well, I, I think, that, yeah, definitely it's a, it's a very difficult question, but I want to uh, share with you that uh, at the international level, there is a, a discussion to design a new collective and quantified goal. Uh, with, we'll replace the 100 billion uh, goal that we, we discussed uh, um, in, in our conversation. So now there is a huge uh, debate about how this goal will be created, not only in the quantitative side, but also in the qualitative side. And it's precisely how it's going to be allocated, what type of sectors will be um, you know, receiving the support, what, uh, how the countries will be accessing. So it's, it's, a, it's a deeper conversation. It's the very first time that we have the opportunity to dig in, in this type of discussion. So uh, if you are interested in, the, in this process and or to be in, involved, please uh, reach to me. I, 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 I have been working in the international negotiations for 14 years and now I have the pleasure to be part of these conversations and are very difficult. And now we, are, we have the opportunity to, to start thinking out of the box as well. So if you have ideas, it's, it's, a, it's a right moment to, to start discussing. And of course, the loss and damage discussion is part of this conversation as well. So now there are a lot of elements uh, in the table that are going to allow us to, to discuss elements that we never discussed before because it was too, too difficult, uh, too political, too, too, too difficult to, to reach to those points. But now we have uh, elements in the negotiation. We have 15 items in the negotiation related to climate finance. And part of this is precisely how we are going to start uh, designing this goal in a way that is uh, not only fair, but also like that responds to the needs of developing countries. And, and this is also uh, the, the part of uh, how, how countries will increase 
access in, in all these. So I, I'm very, very happy to, to share more elements with you, but I think this is, this is the critical point. It's, it's not only about the number, but it's about the impact that the climate finance will create to really start talking about effectiveness and, and to really start putting uh, this idea of, of, of it's, it's, it's possible to, to transform even though we are extremely late at this point, but very happy to continue the conversation. And thank you so much for the opportunity to, to, to be with you and super, super happy to follow up with, with all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sandra. And thank you for everyone for being here. Thank you for your flexibility. Thank you for reminding in the session. That's amazing. And let's be seats. You know, the house is burning. We need to be worried. We need to mobilize resources. We need to identify the ex already existing resources. We need to make sure that these resources are promoting a just society, a sustainable society, and a peaceful society. So I guess I will leave you with that message. Let's, be, uh, let's work for solidarity and let's engage because climate change is not only talking about stats, okay? Climate change is talking about people. It's talking about you. It's talking about your families. It's talking about your communities. And if you, if you are not engaged to change the things from the ground as well and demand your position at the decision-making table, then I think it's gonna be a little bit more harder. So let's remember climate finance for civic engagement. With that, thank you very much, Juan, and thank you very much, Sandra, for reminding on the call. Thank you for your flexibility, and thank you for coming to this event. Thank you.